Hello, everybody. Uh, if I had realized that I might be motivated to make a recording while I was out walking today, I would have brought something to screen the wind. And usually a cotton ball or even some facial tissue wrapped around the mic with a rubber band, something like this. It's enough. It works, it works fine um, for my recording setup. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, all right. So what is on my mind? First of all, I am... Where am I? I am at a lake. It is very windy. And um, no shame for any of you who decide this is too much wind noise for you. Uh, but those of you who are bold can accompany me in this strange adventure where I am risking my life primarily from Widowmaker Tree Falls uh, to get a little exercise on Sunday in the midst of some really interestingly stormy weather. Uh, lots of wind gusts, occasional bouts of serious rain, but not the long, slow, calm kind of rain that um, is often, uh, well, less threatening. When the, min when the wind picks up, the primary threat seems to be trees falling. Um, and where I live, there's a lot of sand. Oh, actually, that's, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Let me be more clear. As I understand it, um, most of Golden Gate Park is a giant sand dune with some complex aquifers underneath it. Um, so, I guess long ago the humans imported a bunch of topsoil, so to speak, and uh, spread it all around. <laughs> and um, one of my friends, well, actually, no longer my friend, mm -hmm. uh, what excommunicated me for Let's see. Uh, I had a tiny bit of a sniffle, and I was outside in the gardens without a mask on. Or no, I had a mask on, actually. Um, but as I wasn't uh, severely quarantining, I guess my friend decided I was a bad man. Um, turned out that it was less than tiny allergies that I was experiencing, not even a cold. Uh, and I certainly wasn't getting in anyone's face. So, um, yes, she once remarked, you know, there's so many non-native trees here and they just don't form deep roots. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, Especially now, it's very obvious to me that she um, having the status that we would associate with a person of color, particularly whose ancestry comes from India, might have been making a psychological, right, a, a, a displacement or a projection in metaphor without knowing it. Because what I saw, we see a lot of trees fall here, right? In fact, I'm looking at five or six that fell recently, um, right now. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Wow. Two, three, four. I mean, it's, you know, it's literally dangerous to be out in weather this windy. Um, the secondary danger for pedestrians is stuff going in your eye, uh, or slipping, um, or being blown. 
or being impaled on your umbrella. But anyway, back to the tree thing. So, um, my friend who excommunicated me is a docent at the botanical gardens, I think, still. Um, and I would be surprised if she did not understand that you're talking about a maximum of two or three feet in most places of topsoil, sometimes less, and then just sand, right? So, you know, when trees fall over, <laughs> I don't think it's because they're non-native, right? They fall over, they don't form um, complex root systems, not because they're not native, but because it's pretty hard to do in sand, right? So, uh, yeah, part of the, huh, it's funny, part of the, um, the trail here has been uh, cordoned off. Um, yeah, I guess there's also, uh, being hit in the head by things that fall that aren't branches, for example, pine cones and stuff, or little pieces of branches, that could wipe you out as a human. Um, it doesn't take a lot of weight coming from the sky, you know, 20, 30 feet above your head, to hurt you or even kill you, um, especially if you're not wearing a hard hat. So. Yeah, lots of risk. What's the upside? Well, a couple of things. One, who, as one gets older, you start to have to pick more or less uh, explicitly between something resembling more adventure or something resembling more safety. And the more safety line is devastating in a bunch of ways because although you could handle maybe you could handle box life um, without too much trouble a while ago when you start getting older the comfort of box life begins to become redolent of the comfort of the grave so to speak uh, metaphorically and so one necessarily chooses and it's a choice that you make each day now it's similar with our minds do we adventure or do we stay in familiar terrain um, and why and what what turns out to happen is it's a bit like exercise if you don't if you don't keep it up um, it tends to, oh wow, there's a little, yeah, see, I just saw a branch fall that could have definitely hurt someone. Thankfully, it was, um, slowish. Oh wow, I just heard another one. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I'm out here and it's, it's like I'm hearing gunshots, right? Except they're not gunshots, they're tree breaks. So it's probably good that trail was cordoned off because I might have been stupid enough to go up there. And I can tell from here, basically, it's a bunch of cypress trees. And <laughs> these things naturally produce, um, I think it's mostly cypress, and they naturally produce these long slender branches that are prone especially when water soaked to just snap off right it might be some kind of you know evolutionary benefit or something maybe maybe those branches both fertilize the ground as they de as they fall apart or um, bring other organisms or root possibly or maybe there's no you know obvious benefit if we're um, doing what we might imagine is Darwinian accounting. 
Uh, which brings me to a variety of topics. Um, I've long held, to switch to the topic of house cats, that house cats are basically, they can be understood from a variety of interesting perspectives, including that they are effectively ambient psychedelic organisms, meaning that if you begin to bond your mind with the mind of uh, a provocatively intelligent house cat rather than a really lazy one, but even the lazy ones are, <laughs> it's like they're smoking opium or something all the time, um, or rather they don't need to smoke anything. Uh, the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland is sort of an example of someone who has noticed the strangeness of the cats. But I have long held that um, <laughs> in terms of intelligence and non-human intelligence and alien-like, not alien as in bad, alien as in um, <laughs> family member from another origin, right? More like that. Um, yeah, the house cats, those are like the square root of an octopus is a house cat, you know? Um, and maybe if you, you know, house cat to the second or third power equals praying mantis or something like this. And, you know, you can flip it around. Um, the, the, the intelligence of the ambush predators is very unique and profound. Um, and the intelligence of a house cat, which is a really peculiar, an animal with a very peculiar history, um, developmental history, uh, very peculiar and trippy, because it goes from being a wild alpha predator to being a half domesticated beta predator, like, you know, delta predator or something that effectively causes its primary symbiont, right, um, captures a food source in humans. Trippy, right? Very strange, very unexpected um, from some perspectives. Now, of course, the natural contrast to a house cat is the dog. Um, similar, <laughs> similar developmental history. Uh, and look, um, cats aren't not pack animals. They just, uh, you know, lions, at least, um, have what we call prides in English uh, groups. And are there other examples? I don't know. There are probably examples of couplings and friendships, but not primary necessary groups. I just don't know enough about the feline animals to know. Um, but there's at least one example of uh, where they form you know, cohorts of pods. And I imagine young lions and perhaps mountain lions and so forth may, certainly when they're young, right, they um, travel and hunt and play with their siblings. And who knows if there's inter, you know, inter-family activity of that kind. So I was talking to my friend uh, Jay the other night, actually it was last night, and we were talking about this, this topic, and I love to wax uh, enthusiastic about the intelligences of the ambush predators because they are, in a sense, <laughs> like, if you want security and, um, familiarity. 
dogs work beautifully, right? Those are the solar animal, essentially, of the pair. And look, there are solar cats and there are lunar dogs, but fundamentally, um, the, the dog is the solar animal. Uh, daytime predator, right? Um, although not entirely, you got coyotes and wolves that are nocturnal. Um, maybe I had that wrong, actually. Uh, nighttime predator, nocturnal. And similarly, cats, also nocturnal, but perhaps more so than dogs, um, tend to sleep all day, stay up all night, uh, left to their own devices, probably. I don't know what they would do in their natural situations, because I don't see those animals in those situations, but I do think of dogs as solar, not explicitly and not only, and cats as lunar. Now there's going to be some serious wind. So we were talking about this the other night. And, okay, what was the topic? All right, the topic was actually pretty deep. It was... A topic that I've spoken of some recently, but even since then, the insight has been enriched. It's the topic of what happens when something captures the nervous system of an animal. And there's lots of stuff that capture our nervous system. Um, a simple example of this is that, you know, it's the Pavlovian thing, right? If we smell something delicious, in fact, I'm just, I'm merely thinking of something delicious and my mouth is starting to water. But if I smell something delicious, much more so. So, that's an example where you can see that I have no, contr I have no mental control over Gale force winds, just short of hurricane speed. <laughs> I have no control over whether my mouth waters or not that I know of. <clears throat> Might be able to influence it with NLP or hypnosis or something, but I have no, no known control over my salivation. And similarly, if I hear one of those gunshot branch cracks and it's loud enough and near enough, probably y'all jump. Um, when you see corvids, at least around here, um, approaching food on the ground, uh, they will often sort of hop toward it and leap backwards. I was thinking a lot about that particular behavior the other day after observing it because trying to understand one thing I can imagine now, which it didn't occur to me before. Wow, this is crazy. I mean, it's not crazy, it's natural, it's just different from the very safe norm that usually applies. And the difference is profound enough that I am well aware I could be killed. It's not very likely, but it's probably 50 times more likely than it was yesterday. <laughs> All right, so... <clears throat> um, the thing that occurs to me now, and I couldn't figure it out before, but now it seems relatively obvious, uh, snakes eat birds. And one of the best ways to catch a bird would be to hang out near the corpse of an animal, right? You're an ambush predator. You have that, that feline intelligence, that praying mantis intelligence, that octopus intelligence, the jumping spider intelligence, 
right? You have this trap setting capable, capable of setting a trap intelligence. Praying mantis is straight up set traps on flowers, right? Just no doubt about it. You see them do it all the time. So why wouldn't ambush predators set traps on corpses? And since corvids eat meat, um, they eat other stuff too. They eat seeds and bugs and worms and stuff. It depends on the birds and where they are. Since they eat meat, what might happen is a snake might, or other ambush predator possibly, not sure what, a bobcat maybe? Um, what else would eat birds? I don't think, I mean coyotes eat birds, but they also eat dead things. Snakes don't usually, I don't know of any snakes that eat corpses. Um, now, you can teach cage snakes to eat dead mice. I don't know if they eat dead mice in the wild. Not clear to me. It seems pragmatically effective that they should. I just don't know. Um, but yeah, I can imagine snake uh, hangs out near bird food of any kind. Right? Dead things, seed piles, you name it. Um, and just waits for birds and waits close enough that when the bird gets to the food item it's within striking distance of the snake so that would explain evolutionarily how the peck jump back like it's literally like that that um, that song that has the lyrics jump back jack in it. Uh, the bird like goes forward and then leaps backward. And it may do that a few times. And after like two or three times, it'll, it may just fly off and leave the food alone. That does happen. I've seen it. But what's going on there isn't that the bird is thinking, uh, I'm scared. I think what's going on is that the bird's nervous system has been captured by something like an evolutionarily developed and look the thing may not be genetic there's got to be nine other ways of influencing organisms that aren't merely genes and most of those ways might we would argue would, would necessarily have some effect on genomes because they <laughs> they become selection variables in that theory and we're gonna get some weird stuff about that in a minute um, so they might, have, they might have selective functions, so to speak, or effect. But yeah, what I think is going on is that the organism's nervous system has been captured, and like a goose that sees a ball rolled a few feet from its nest during a certain season, it will go, the goose will crane its neck, at least this is what I've heard, crane its neck, from research, crane its neck, go toward the ball and roll the ball back into the nest whether or not there's a ball there anymore at all. And, and you know, whether or not it much resembles an egg. So you can see that there are these protocols. You know, in the age of computers, we would be likely to call them programs because we're just reaching around for some metaphor but it's a historically, physically structured vulnerability to capture um, when an organism detects high heat suddenly, it recoils. Um, it may recoil from other things, water, uh, food that may not be safe or smells wrong. Um, you know, one kid on the bus uh, disgorges his breakfast on the floor. Now you pretty soon have what? A... Oh, this could be good. There's a siren. We might get a demonstration of this effect. Let's see.
uh, yeah, pretty soon you've got, you know, <laughs> um, sudden unexpected public <laughs> vomitorium <laughs> on the bus, right? Because once two more kids follow suit, and they're certainly not doing that on purpose, right? They're not trying to do that. They don't want to do that. They can't help it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> we didn't get the example I wanted. So, um, you can see that there's a structured response um, that's probably ordinarily, rather than being activated, I mean, we can think of it both ways and we probably should. Um, rather than being activated by stimuli, it could also just be ordinarily inhibited and under some circumstances that inhibition collapses and the coyote howls in concert with the approach of a siren, not because it wants to, not because, pro I mean, possibly it's in pain. It is possible, we don't know. And it's reasonable to imagine it might be. Um, when you present uh, wildly exaggerated stimuli to an extremely sensitive organisms um, to a hypersensitive organism, right? If a wasp can detect one molecule of a substance within a two-mile range, like within a two-mile circle, as I understand it, some wasps are capable of that degree of sensitivity. If you <laughs> subject them to, for example, um, some kind of human perfume, laundry soap, for example, laundry soap stench, um, could be physically painful to them. So <clears throat> we don't know whether the siren is physically painful, but we do know that it resembles other coyotes calling. And so when the dogs howl and the coyotes um, howl at the siren, there's a good chance that they're just being triggered, right? Their body is howling, not their mind. And, um, you know, we hear people talk about sensory experiences like the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Um, I got goosebumps. And obviously goosebumps are a thing that happens when we're cold too, but uh, there are certain physiological transformations. Uh, heart palpitates. Right? We like, I don't know if we like it, I think we like it because we're, our, most of our experience is kind of deadened. But we like horror movies sometimes, or we may like um, scary rides because they deprive us of the control we might ordinarily have over our body's sensations or the selection of sensations, right? Actively selecting sensations um, and subject us to extraordinary forces and sensations. So we too can be triggered. Um, it would be interesting to see the library of programs, so to speak. They're not actually programs, I don't think. But to see like the library of a single creature. Now, obviously, if you observe a single creature very closely over time and you observe many of them, many of their kind, quote unquote, you will begin to understand something of the library. Uh, so, praying mantises, for example, will, they have a complex striking uh, behavior. It's a prey capture behavior, but they can use it like a punch as well. 
and they have a complex uh, threat display where their body transforms you know, into a creature oriented to both fight and shock uh, a possibly predatory animal creature. Um, so we were talking about the peculiarities. Obviously, right, like social media is weaponizing this against us. It, one could say it is studying, in a sense, human reactivity and then producing hopeful monsters that capture it, amplify it, um, and make it contagious. That's one of the dumbest uses of technology that anyone could imagine. I mean, it's almost as dumb as just throwing bricks at people's heads. The, pr the problem here is that they can't see the brick. Right? It has the same effect in that they get dumber every time they're subjected to it, most of them. Some of them have a good buffer, some of the humans. Um, but yeah, they get dumber every time, like every iteration makes them dumber. And the problem there is really dangerous because Anything that reduces your awareness or sensitivity over time is prone to create a situation where you, can't, you won't be able to perceive what you've lost. And this is part of the problem with ordinary human aging. One might argue that social media ages certain aspects of us um, precipitously and invisibly since our bodies don't age in response though I think actually internally they do we don't notice uh, anything that affects the thing you notice with right creates a really good a really effective process that hides its own it hides its own progress and it hides the damage it does. It naturally does this. So we want to have awareness when we approach technologies or media. Um, we want to have awareness of what's getting compromised, how quickly, how deeply, uh, and how can we, if it, if it becomes necessary for some reason that we interact with the technology anyway, or if we want to. Um, we want to have the intelligence necessary to make determinations about what that curve of harm looks like to whatever degree we are able, and then adjust our behavior accordingly so as to preserve the assets that would otherwise be lost. Now you can see that the crows, for example, when they approach a food source on the ground, start to go at it and then jump back. They're testing to see if anything moves nearby the food during that process. And if it does, they will become aware that the food is a trap. Now, obviously, also, once humans became uh, tool makers of some kind, they probably made bird traps too, of various kinds. And so the bird is trying to check whether, you know, probably A, whether there's a organismal trap, and B, whether there's a physical trap, even though it may not. Its body probably isn't complexly differentiating between those two things. All right, so... Triggering. I think even likely for an organism to take advantage 
of programs that are normally, let's not call them programs, let's call them abilities. For the, or, hmm, what do I want to call them? <laughs> abilities. Each organism seems to uniquely develop of <laughs> yeah this is this starts to run into problems between the difference between language and description and what animals and organisms actually are and are doing our being um, so imagine a broad spectrum of unique forms of sensitivity and or intelligence that naturally result in high, um, super effective, like meta effective, uh, relational or physical skills. One can imagine that it might be possible for an organism to discover, like especially for humans, for example, because we have a lot, we have a great deal of luxury compared to most animals in consciously determining our developmental spectrum, spectra. Uh, so the humans, we probably have access to at least probably thousands of potentially developable abilities that result when enacted in something resembling either relational or physical superfunction or both. And one tends to lead to the other, right? Because, for example, brilliant athletes who become known for their athleticism acquire relational benefits, uh, what we call fame which radically increases both their, the opportunity space for reproduction, but also for just uh, enjoyment. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, because of how strange the humans are in modernity, and maybe forever, that will also attract enemies, um, opponents, undesirable, possibly obsessive attention from other humans. And maybe under some circumstances from the sky itself. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so my friend and I were talking about cats and she said something resembling, you know, well, I was talking about how cats can be triggered, right? If they, and that sometimes um, house cats uh, dogs, you can see dogs doing a beha behaviors, displaying behaviors that, <clears throat> and I guess I'm anthropomorphizing a bit, that may be natural for humans, or at least some humans. Um, you know, when a dog makes a silly mistake, a silly physical mistake, or like it misses the bite, or it slides, chasing the ball, it crashes into the wall. Or, and by the way, that's, you can see triggering right there because the dog ordinarily does not crash into things. But under circumstances where it becomes hyper-focused on the ball, it will crash in. Many dogs will just crash into walls or other nearby objects. So... Okay, we're in gale force winds again. Dogs appear to exhibit emotions that resemble shame and or embarrassment. I'm granting that that's my interpretation. After, cert after being witnessed, <laughs> they seem to be aware of observation in a way not dissimilar to how we are. Um, if I suddenly step on the side of my foot, for example, 
and begin to stumble because I misstepped. Uh, the first problem is the pain in my ankle, but the second problem is, did anybody see me? You know, I will quickly glance around to see if I have been seen to have failed at something as simple as taking a step. Right. Uh, <laughs> so I was, I was explaining that it was my experience. When I began to learn more about cats, because my girlfriend had a pair, and certainly I'd encountered them many times before, but I think this pair of cats was the pair I was most intimate with of any throughout my life. Um, to memorialize them, Mexicat and Panther, which who was her son. Mexicat was a very hyper intelligent, sensitive, loving, soft mother cat, very fluffy furry white, found in the desert with a piece of her tail missing as a kitten, I think, if I remember right. And Panther was one of her children. Big, black, fluffy uh, cat. And Panther would, when we were playing, occasionally, and I've seen other cats do this, very few of them won't be triggered if you accept the gambit. So this is... <laughs> This is a gambit in animal chess called cat belly. Um, when dogs give you their belly, it may or may not be submissive, but it's, they're, they're showing their vulnerability because their primary powers as an animal um, are The primary powers are like a spear in a dog. They lunge and penetrate. Um, the cat is different. It can lunge, but it normally attacks with paws because those are razor sharp and grippy. And once it gets a grip, then it can penetrate usually the neck of a creature, often the neck, with jaws. Both animals have bone-breaking jaw power. Uh, the cat's is less because it's smaller, the house cat anyway. Um, but what, what she was saying, I was saying that basically sometimes I would pet Panther and he would, you know, roll over on his back. And this seemed to be an invitation for, you know, some gentle, aware belly petting. Um, gentle and aware both because you know this is an animal's vulnerable underside and previous experience had taught me that under certain conditions cats become triggered and when they are triggered they may bite unintentionally and usually they can manage the force so that it's not really bad it's still painful um, and they also can, uh, there's some word for this, it's not worry, that's what a dog does, it's some kind of shredding thing. They basically um, uh, grasp with their front paws and may claw with them, and then shred or gash with their rear paws. And so what would happen is I'd be petting Panther, we'd be having like a love session, and you know, he really, he really enjoys that. But then sometimes he would get triggered and capture my hand, bite it, and try to rip at it with his back claws. And then he would, <laughs> he would sort of snap out of it and display signs of, that I interpreted as sadness, shame, embarrassment. I didn't mean to do that, this kind of thing. And uh, it took me a long time to understand what was going on. I certainly didn't understand to the degree that I, you know, in anything that resembles what I'm saying now, I, w I was unconsciously aware, but not cognitively and conceptually aware of, the, of what was going on. I didn't have a model. But I did learn very quickly that when cats show you their belly, 
it's either one of two things usually going on. Either they really will enjoy the intimacy and danger of allowing effectively a god, right, an animal that is unimaginably powerful full <laughs> compared to you. Um, you can kill a cat probably just by crushing its ribcage in your single, in the grip of one hand, right? You can kill it. <laughs> if you wanted to kill a cat, hopefully you don't. Um, it, it would take very little effort on your part to destroy the animal physically. And there's very little the cat could do about it. So, and the cat may not know your physical strength, but it probably suspects it from examining you. <laughs> so when the cat rolls over, either <clears throat> um, it has learned to inhibit the triggering that is likely to happen when you approach its belly with your hand and begin stroking it. Um, and so it just enjoys the ecstatic feeling of being vulnerable, like being loved <laughs> where one is most vulnerable, so to speak, in human language. Um, but other cats, and again, look, the cat rolls over and displays its belly. So something's going on there. But it's not necessarily, my friend was saying, a display of submission or, you know, <laughs> Because when the cat is on its back, all 20 of its face knife foot razors are accessible and the bite. And so now, <clears throat> it can grip with its forepaws, bite, and shred with its hind legs. And this is a, for, for many animals, I suspect, this is a disemboweling move, right? It opens up, first of all, it just opens up gashes on the animal. If you're a large cat, if you're a small cat, it still messes them up. <clears throat> so yeah, we had a big laugh because she was like, the cat rolls over and people think it's a submission move because they've been watching dogs or something. It may or may not be partly submissive, but basically the cat now has full access to all of its weapons. <laughs> it's almost like the cat is saying, like the cat is daring you. Right, do you want to put your hand in the chainsaw? <laughs> It's like a Tasmanian devil in Looney Tunes, right? It just rips things apart. <coughs> so I thought that was hilarious, hilarious take on, on cats. But if you want non-ordinary experience, um, if you're someone who seeks that, the best place to seek it is in... Uh, devoted contact with a living place, with specific animals and birds, specific plants. You know, it doesn't matter whether plants have spirits or plants have minds. They are organisms and we are organisms and we are organisms from the same world. So in one set of categories, that makes us the same thing, the same being. We are that... <laughs> That tree is me outside my body. I am the tree outside its trunk. And I'm not saying this is a fact, but it is categorically true. Before even we are organisms, we are beings. Right? So it goes like, the concentric circles go like mystery, <laughs> universe, then beings and organisms and earth organisms and then, you know, on down the line to animals, human animals. And that's just, what if, what if our category tree is missing three important elements, and I would argue it is, so that we can't even see them in language. There's no way to detect them in, in, the, in concepts because we have no placeholder for them in our categorical libraries. Um, 
And I think actually this is a huge problem for all humans. But particularly for we who speak English, because our category tree is, uh, huh. it's almost like it was hit by a shotgun or something. It's missing big chunks of crucially important placeholders, um, shelves, containers, so forth, uh, that would draw our attention to modes of existence that we no longer have a placeholder for. And so, since we don't, most of those modes get um, they get exported to the supernatural, the psychic, the superstitious, the religious, but they shouldn't. They don't need to be. The actual situation is so weird that it's weirder than all of supernatural speculation it's weirder than all religious speculation. It's weirder than all of science. So none of those should become the authorities of identity. Those are conceptual frameworks, right? <clears throat> you might argue, one might reasonably argue that humans are particularly vulnerable to structured reactions that are not necessarily physical, but are similarly involuntary and are conceptual, right? Uh, what would be an example? Well, <clears throat> weirdly, I was listening to the most enlightening podcast last night on, I think a philosopher called Dugan that it is in thought, that it is thought, or Durgan, that it is thought influenced, uh, influences Putin's um, policy dramatically. Um, and for the first time I heard powerful criticisms of the concept of liberal, being liberal. Um, so yes, where was I going? All right. Uh, examples of such cognitive traps are the Christian belief that everybody who doesn't accept Jesus is going to hell and that there's a Satan. Um, now, similarly, the doctrinal liberal belief, once it becomes doctrine, once you have to either be liberal or fascist, the liberal belief that you get to invent your identity, you get to invent your gender, you are free to completely dispose of all conventions and anyone who doesn't dispose of these conventions is evil, particularly if they do not dispose of them in the way that you dispose of them. Now you have sectarian liberality, right? And this can become extremely dangerous, virulent, and compelling for humans. We adopt programs from not tradition, but traditional language and the traditional presuppositions about identity, meaning, and value. Also, which games are played that are imported when we learn a modern language, particularly in my case, I can speak um, only tellingly about English. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, it's interesting. Um, I've walked around the lake, I think I'm on my third circuit, 
I'm sure you heard that sound. That sound was the sound of a spear falling from a cypress into the ground a foot from me. It was pointed straight down. It was pointy on the end. It stuck into the ground and it had a, a cone on it. It was small, but uh, had I been struck by that, likely I'd have been injured, possibly seriously. So it's probably time to stop the adventure, but I'm not going to just yet because the sun has come back out and there's a break in the rain and it's a good time to uh, stretch my legs, <clears throat> I think. Of course, I could walk in safer places. Uh, what's that? that startled me, so <laughs> I branched and thought. Yes, so the humans are vulnerable. Okay, when we learn a language like English, a bunch of games are imported, like Courtroom Mind or War Mind or Mine and Yours or Us and Them. Now, Us and Them exists in most languages and conceptual frameworks, uh, but the way the particular character of the English, the modern, the colonial, the neo colonial, the para colonial, You know what that is? It's probably crashing, crashing trees. It's tree branches snapping. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> yeah, be careful. Uh, there, I've seen branches fall on the path. It's very, very windy. It, they, they can kill you. I'm not saying don't walk. I'm out here walking too. Yeah, yeah, but, but just be aware because... It feels like it's in the, in the it is. island. It's yeah. In the vicinity, so, but yeah, yeah, but I almost got hit a moment ago. Uh -huh by like a spear that stuck in the ground and it was like a foot from me. So be, you know, be aware, those, those cypresses, they naturally drop large branches. So on that side, you're at risk. I see. Around this side, not so much. Yeah, maybe we'll go. Yeah, okay, you, my pleasure. Yeah, there were some gunshot branch cracks. Huh. <laughs> All right, I keep getting um, distracted, but thanks for bearing with me, those of you who have. Hopefully, I'll give you some, uh, some juicy morsels here. Um, all right, so complex array of what I would call malware comes packaged with English, and it's not actually, it's not in the language per se. The malware isn't necessarily in the language. The malware is packaged in metaphors, models of identity, meaning, value, relation, function, um, efficacy, and basically good and evil that come from the cultural or anti-cultural, right, the malware traditions that uh, influenced how we tend to utilize the language together, particularly today and over, say, the past two, three hundred years. Um, the malware package that's attached to languages evolves over time along with the language. It's not clear that the languages contain malware, rather it's the suppositions underlying their deployment, and particularly their deployment um, beyond the personal, like the person-to-person -person environment in the larger social and <laughs> disease-riddled <laughs> um, cultural dumpster fire that is you know, modernity.
back into the gusty winds, but not too dangerous here. There's no trees likely to drop a branch on me near me. All right, so <clears throat> recently I've been listening to people like David Berlinski, and actually there's a primary author whose name I can't remember, but also um, a man whose name I'm going to mispronounce, David Gelertner. And if you want to find this, if you want to find one of the things I listen to, um, just search on mathematics and Darwin. And, okay. So Darwin's book was called The Origin of Species. It is, by, it is, you know, he was the Einstein in a sense of biology in that he gave us a map that appeared to be valid and explanatory for a broad range of uh, observable phenomena. Um, and doctrinally, it is canon. To oppose it in any way is to earn broad denigration, attack, um, insult, and so forth. Uh, and this is unfortunate because science should never be about doctrine. Science should be about discovery <clears throat> and um, logical, rational thought. It should not cater to biases or presuppositions. In fact, it shouldn't cater to anything but the facts and an ever-improving description of the relationships between them that we observe. Obviously, this involves explanatory manifolds, um, so intuition and suppositions about identity function, distinction, and, and you know, the scientific method is fundamentally dissective, so it tends to break things down into parts and then examine relationships. That by itself can be an error. But um, <clears throat> nearly every biologist believes, uh, well, maybe that's not true. Um, many, many modern biologists believe that a moment that the book entitled The Origin of Species does in fact tell us how species arose. And so is generally accepted as an origin of life argument, tells us how we got species from the origin, you know, organisms. Now, it doesn't make any, I don't, I don't actually know the book well. I doubt it makes claims about origin of life, because that's still quite mysterious. Uh, even though the mechanical, physicalist, eliminative, materialist version is either soup, you got a complex soup on Earth that eventually produced cells, <clears throat> or, you know, RNA. Um, and then there's some, you know, leap from RNA to cells and DNA and bacteria and protists and archaea and so forth. Um, but nobody knows how you get from chemistry to life. There are precisely zero successful models of this. Uh, lots of people have speculations. Some of those speculations, the belief is generally, and what is taught is that life is the mechanical result of the combination of chemicals and forces on Earth. Um, and a number of scientists who are not trying to import God into biology are making the claim for intelligent design 
by falsifying something resembling um, Darwin's blind watchmaker claim. I.e., okay, so the one of the old proofs of the existence of God was the unimaginable complexity of organisms. Now, our human experience of that complexity and our cognition about it has changed quite a bit over many years, particularly since Darwin, and has been influenced by a bunch of doctrinal garbage that really has nothing to do with it. But a long time ago, someone, possibly Bacon, argued, maybe it was Francis Bacon, I, don't, I can't remember, um, argued that the existence of organisms proves the existence of God because if you were walking along a if you were walking along a path in the forest and you looked down and you saw for example <laughs> I'm going to use a sort of weird example um, a colander right uh, or a knife. I'm using a very simple physical object, a knife. You would not presume, it would be very unlikely for you to presume, that the knife had been produced by the accidental combination of substance and forces. Um, there are certain kinds of objects that naturally, to our intuition, imply a mind was involved in creating them. And fundamentally, these objects can be said, and in some cases uh, blatantly, obviously do, they can be said to encode information. <coughs> <coughs> so, for example, um, DNA is a digital data storage and propagation machine. If we think in those terms, I don't, but I'll use the language common to biologists of my day. They tend to think as the they th they think of cells and organisms as machines, which I think is hilarious. I get what they mean. Um, they don't mean diesel engine. They mean a structured process that causes the transformation, combination, and distinction of various substances and structures over time. I mean, something resembling that. I don't think of them as machines, but we'll use the language. So, where was I? The machines. Okay. There are precise, precisely zero instances we know of where complex ordered information was produced without a mind. Um, the biologists are presuming, unjustifiably, that the cell is such an arrangement. There is no evidence for that. In fact, uh, if we do the math, these scientists argue, um, I think one of the guys wrote a book that might be called Darwin's Delusion. And by the way, what they're saying is effectively this. Um, Darwin got the theory right for downstream transformations of genomes, mutations, um, changing parts of an animal from, you know, a bat wing to a bird wing or something, right? Um, mutations that don't wipe out the organism. And we'll get to an interesting feature of that in a minute. So, <laughs> uh, the, the scientists that are questioning this, and look, we don't have any good arguments for origin of life. Panspermia um, is a change of arena, right? That's a rhetorical fallacy. You just move the, <clears throat> you move the question elsewhere without supplying any useful further information about it, right? Um, because you have the same problem with panspermia that you have with origin of life on Earth. 
if life traveled here from elsewhere, it had to begin somehow. And so it either began on a planet like ours or it began in interstellar space or it began somewhere. Maybe something we don't even understand. You know, again, <coughs> um, the origin of life could be so profound that the concepts we presently rely on uh, are insufficient. Right? Um, though the scientists rarely argue this. So what they're saying, so first of all, we have no good explanation for the origin of life. Many biologists believe that it's essentially a mechanical accident. There's no evidence for the involvement of an intelligence. Uh, these scientists believe that there's no evidence for the accident. In fact, they cite mathematical analyses of, for example, the probability of accidentally producing what? <laughs> um, a useful protein, I think, is the example they gave. Um, I can't recall if they were examining for, you know, an amino acid or what specific um, biochemical element they were, they were speaking of. But I think what they said is that the chances of producing a useful protein by accident, okay, the search space is something like 1 in 10 to the 70. And that's just one protein. We're not talking about you accidentally produced an organism. Um, that resembles the probability of being able to locate a single point particle, say a uh, proton, single proton, in a search space nine times, <laughs> like as large as nine of our universe as we presently understand it. Uh, the chances of you might as well call it impossible. Berlinski says, if you want to say it's impossible, I'm on your side. If you want to say it's improbable, I'm on your side. But let's be clear, it's monumentally improbable. And, you know, something I've argued for probably almost 20 years is that the complexity of the cell radically defies anything, any explanation that the humans can come up with at all. And this has turned out to be prophetic in that you know, every 10 years or so, the complex, as the complexity, as the apparent complexity of the cell expands for our science, perhaps sometimes geometrically, the possibility of explaining it recedes with every expansion. Um, and it recedes at a similar pace, right? It's like, you thought you knew what was going on, you now found out there were 10 trillion variables you weren't including, your chance of explaining that <laughs> mostly just disappears into infinity. <laughs> you know, in my perspective, uh, I think our physical theories are insufficient to explain biological phenomena um, and their origins and their meanings and almost certainly their purposes, which, of which reproduction is not, you know, in the physicalist lexicon, that's the crucial thing to do. Um, wow, really? Hmm. But there's probably 900 other things they're doing, and there's certainly 15 of those that are Nothing like what we suppose. If you actually observe organisms with an open mind, you're going to discover something that generally defies description. It's not there for, descript for the purpose of humans describing it. <laughs> There's nothing to do. Okay, what the heck is this? It's an artificial rock? I don't understand. Oh, I see, it's a rat trap. 
It's a rat trap that looks like a rock. Wow, humans are crazy. Hmm. I think I should visit my friend, the tree. So, the scientists are in question here are very upset that textbook biology and the the broad scale um, supposition of mechanical accident as origin for life, a proposition for which not only is there no evidence or nearly none, um, if we run some of the analytic math so that we come to understand what the actual probabilities we, we should be looking at are at this phase in our understanding. <clears throat> the math points in the direction that unless, unless something really strange here happened, unless you hit the lottery, you know, unless you won the lottery 9,000 times in a row, like you, you won almost every time you played, there's no chance of producing, not, not never mind organisms, just RNA, DNA, the complex um, protein synthesis apparatus of cells, all of these things. Or not no chance, but an unimaginable, an almost infinitely unimaginably small chance. Literally, you know, zero. Um, with a bit, you know, I don't know, 5,000 decimal points after it and then a one. So uh, I looked up the author. Um, <clears throat> perhaps Berlinski has collaborated with him, Stefan Meyer. Uh, they have some essays and books, The Deniable Darwin, Darwin's Doubt. Um, and I suspect they also make arguments that Darwin himself doubted that his theory was any explanation for the emergence of organisms on Earth or for the poorly defined idea of species. Um, so it turns out that the origin of life arguments that are doctrinal are mostly nonsense. It's not that they're, that it's entirely impossible that the emergence of life on Earth was a purely mechanical accident. It's, we have the actual problem, you know, minus uh, the supposition of God in the original argument that if you find something finely articulated, and what could be more finely articulated than a blue jay, it makes, I mean, just at, it, at the level of its cells, it's 900 magnitudes of complexity beyond any machine we've ever built. A single cell staggers the, the computational complexity of the entire history of humans doing math. Um, and it does that over the temporal space of like 10 seconds or maybe even one, and we're talking a single cell. So you have a cellular hyperstructure like a blue jay or a raccoon. You're looking at something that <clears throat> is pure science fiction. Uh, there's no chance of something that sophisticated and agentive was produced by accident, at least not in any way that we can presently propose um, when we find in nature extremely complex objects invariably they are the produce of minds with zero known exceptions so it's it's sort of the opposite <laughs> of the problem we have with um, 
Sorry, I'm getting <laughs> battered by the weather. Um, it's the opposite of the problem we have with the technical probability of there being life on other planets. Technically, um, due to how statistics and probability function, if you have only a single uh, <clears throat> example of something, you have no chance of determining the probability. Therefore, the probability is stated as zero. So, until probabilistically, according to how we use statistics and probability, um, there is zero probability of life on other worlds because it's unknown. You have no data. Right? With no data, you can't produce a probabilistic estimate. There are other ways to estimate the probability. Intuitively, we are very unlikely to believe that in a universe as vast as ours, this is the only planet with life, that life, we would have to believe that life cannot spread from solar system to solar system, or that there are no mechanisms for that transfer to take place. Because if there were, especially if there were fast methods, um, something, uh, Possibly Sheldrake's morphogenic fields might represent a, a sort of layer in, in the universe or in time space in which once you manage to get an organism on one world somewhere in time, it's now vastly easier to get it on another one. Um, I doubt any of these scientists are fans of Sheldrake, meaning Berlinski, Gelertner, and Meyer. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is, it could be that there are features of the everything, right? And I prefer that term. <laughs> or really, the every one thing way. <laughs> all nests, there are features of the grand unity that we don't know anything about and could easily, I think, could reasonably, possibly set up a network between planets where information is transferred either at incredible speed or instantaneously. There might be forms of fields capable of doing this. But this is my argument, not theirs. Um, what is their argument? So their argument is that if you take the entire biospace of organisms that we believe have ever existed on Earth, this includes you know, bacteria, viruses, the whole damn thing, everything, that number is something like 10 to the 40. Uh, if you then divide the search space 10 to the 70 by the number of chances you have to produce, say, one useful protein. Um, you're left with, I don't know, 10 to the 30 or something. Uh, which is effectively no chance. It means that over the history of life on Earth, there wasn't time to accidentally assemble a useful protein. Uh, unless something was going on that we don't understand. Right? And this inclines them to believe that, that the explanation of intentional terraforming or bioforming is vastly, vastly more probable than this was a mechanical accident. You got some chemistry together you got some forces together, bloop, out pops organisms that make unimaginably complex proteins. And, you know, RNA, DNA, mRNA, all of these things, right? Uh, that stuff just pops up, you know, on a roulette wheel, right? You just keep spinning the wheel long enough, bloop, 
out comes Archaea. So yeah, wildly unlikely. Um, whatever Darwin showed us, it wasn't how species originated. A really good grasp on um, certain features of, of biology, mutation, selection, all this but nothing for how species arise, right? How do you get a different animal from a prototype? We don't know. And it, it's very unlikely to be accidental. So it turns out there's another problem, which is something like the incredible amount of wind and rain pounding into my face at the moment. No, I'm kidding. Um, there's another problem where the kinds of mutations that would give you a different animal from a prototype animal have to happen early in oh God, blastogenesis. I might have that wrong, but they have to happen fairly early in the process of producing an organism from oocytes, right, from, from egg and sperm and so forth. Um, although uh, <laughs> the language is more complex than what I'm, than what I'm presenting here. Um, I'm not sure a sperm is a, I think there's a different word for the sperm. Uh, so you have to produce a mutation early in the process to get a different animal. And if you produce mutations early in the process, what you get is a dead animal. Like, if you make any mistake early in the process, it's invariably fatal. So if you get a, an early mutation, <laughs> they said, like, someone said it was probably um, Gelertner. I think he said, you know, you have, like, 19 tails or way too many organs that don't fit inside the animal or you leave out like it doesn't make blood right something fundamental goes sideways and the only way to get different animals that we know of that we can imagine is mutations early in the in the process of generating the animal <clears throat> um Again, those mutations tend to be fatal, so you can't use mutations early in the process. And late in the process, later in the process, doesn't produce different animals, it produces different traits. So effectively, if I understood their argument, there's no space in the developmental arc of an organism that we can understand that would allow a mutation to produce a new animal. So how do you get stuff like the Cambrian explosion? It looks like on Earth we have something, rather than um, gradual, meticulous evolution of animals, which I think was long held to be the likely case, um, we have sudden like pulses of unexpected diversification, blossoming of myriad species, myriad different organisms. And that certainly isn't explained by anything. <laughs> um, we have no idea how you get... I mean, I have some <laughs> propositions about this. I would argue that um, it's probably, it could be helpful, very helpful, to look at the organisms of Earth as a single organism, an organism that naturally diverges from um, its origins or naturally enacts its original 
uh, what? Naturally enacts its original endowments and propensities by diversifying. Um, that leaves me challenged to the same problem that any biologist would be challenged with, which is explain the, the mechanism that produces the diversification. We have no explanation. So we go back to the problem of you find a wristwatch, right? You find something as complex as a wristwatch. And by the way, let's be very clear, a cell is, I don't know, 10 to the 900 times more complex than a, wish, a wristwatch. So if you find one of those, you know, imagine, I don't know, imagine you're walking around on a, on a new planet and you find what? I don't even know. A hypercomputer the size of a pinhead. You discover that there's these little pinhead-like crystals on the ground. When you examine them, you determine that they're hypercomputers. They can warp time. They can do all kinds of impossible things. And you decide, oh, the universe must just have accidentally produced these. <laughs> like the possibility of accidental production of an organism is so much more remote than the accidental production of a wristwatch. There's no chance. There's no way we could understand how such complexity could be accidentally produced in the time frame we suppose. Now, if, you know, it's not even clear that the universe has been around long enough to do that. Not, not clear enough to me. Um, given our estimates of its age, and presuming that what we're thinking about as time is even relevant at the scale of the universe, which it may not be, it could be totally some other property that governs that, um, and most likely one we have no concept for. Uh, all right, so what else? What other problems? So many problems. Um, there are still people who believe and do science around the supposition that it's a mechanical accident and it's reproducible. We can figure out how to produce the mechanical accident in the lab and thus produce life forms from forces and substances. The hubris implicit in the um, suppositions of the materialists and those who um, unjustifiably presume that no intelligences were involved in the production of the intelligence with which they examine the question. It's an accidental, you know, it's an epiphenomenon, right, of the nature of time, space, planets, and stars. Right? They just accidentally produce these minds. There's nothing mind-like in them. There's nothing meta-mind-like. There's nothing transcendent in them. And it's an entirely mechanical process, unguided by anything. Right? It's just not... The only thing that guides it are in some way the forces, uh, which would be, you know, 
chemical bonding properties, chemical transformation properties, gravity, electromagnetism, strong force, the weak force, etc., etc. Seems unlikely to me. So that's been a fascinating. I never really believed that. To be honest, um, I never supposed. I didn't trust the doctrines. I can sense dark doctrines and sort of smell the stink of them in various branches of science and philosophy. And I tend to be, uh, <laughs> I, let's just say I have great antipathy for them. In my own view, there are a variety of intelligences. I don't merely suppose that intelligences were involved in the composition of organisms. I take the claim much further. Um, it seems very likely to me that something beyond intelligence was involved, probably in the construction of time space, because you have a similar problem there right, which is the fine-tuning problem, and it's a huge problem. Now, there is one way to uh, sort of, what's the right word? There's one way to account for the fine-tuning problem that's a little strange but interesting to mention. It is that you have a sort of a popcorn machine, right? But instead of producing popped kernels of corn, it produces universes. And most of those universes are not viable. <clears throat> the forces don't interact, quote unquote, properly or in such a way as to um, what, what is meant by viable is achieves extent in time. Uh, so you keep bubbling these universes up from some universe progenitor field, okay? And the non-viable universes mostly quickly dissolve and only the viable universes persist. So you will naturally, if you find yourself anywhere, if you find yourself at all, you will find yourself in a persistent universe. Otherwise, you won't have a self to find or find with. And this is sometimes um, offered as an explanatory uh, an explanatory prosthesis for um, for the strangely perfect, you know, the Goldilocks universe uh, and the Goldilocks solar system both, right? Because you have to have both. You can't have a Goldilocks universe. I mean, you can't have a Goldilocks solar system in a non-Goldilocks universe. So. Uh, in this model, something just keeps producing nascent universes and some of those turn out to be viable and you will only have minds and bodies and organisms in those that do. Therefore, that, you know, sort of explains the, uh, the existence of the fine-tuning problem. What was Meyer's objection to that? It was kind of brilliant. Oh, no, he was using someone else's objection. I wonder if I can recall it. I don't think I can. But yeah, I find this fascinating and, and brilliant because these are serious scientists. They are not theists. Um, even though one of them might be religious, maybe a couple of them are, I'm not sure. Um, but they're not attempting to import God. 
right? They're not trying to sneak God past your scientific nose. They're saying, look, um, the complexity we're discovering here cannot have been produced. There's not enough time to have produced even some of its more basic features uh, in terms of the age of the earth. Now, I could see that someone could say, um, produce the features off world somewhere import them to the earth and then things go along fine. I can imagine that line of argument, but you, you, you may have the same problem elsewhere. What's the actual lifespan of a planet, presuming that, that's, that life only occurs on planets, which is something I don't presume. Since I don't know where life originates, I, I tend to be open-minded and speculative about that. But yeah, we've got a huge problem with the origin of life on earth in modern science. The problem is steeped in doctrine the doctrine makes no sense, never made sense. Similar to the move to evacuate the universe of meaningful intelligences, right? Because we were, we were, science was so busy trying to get rid of God that it threw everything away. And just decided, no, it's all, it's all just mechanics, dude. There's no, there's no evidence of any kind of... Um, there's no evidence of any kind of intelligence version of what we used to call the ether, which probably got replaced by the, 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 the propensity of time space to curve around mass, uh, to become curved at, at, at complex structure. Now, more than like, there may be forces that we don't know about, too, right? I mean, I'm quite sure there must be constants and forces that we haven't discovered that might naturally mechanically produce life, but we can't argue for the existence of those until we have some evidence of them. And we can't make arguments that this, the complexity we're seeing just plopped out of a roulette wheel there's no real chance of that being true as far as I can see. So I am now home and safe and alive. I am grateful for all of you who have braved this long journey with me, the terrifying noise of the wind in the mic. I'm grateful for all of you who support my work and please do if you enjoy it, at least you know, log into YouTube and give me a like or, or a shared link or something. And if you'd, if you'd like to support my work more directly. I'd be very grateful for that. A dollar a month matters. Um, if you want to make a one-time donation, uh, just let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll get you a way to do that. I'm so grateful to those who do support my work. Thank you, all of you. You help me keep making this content and I really, really appreciate it. So I look forward to learning together again very soon. May your ways and world be blessed, amazing, and joyful. Bye-bye for now.